Undoubtedly, there is one thing that has been on the minds of many Americans this week. One thing that as Adventists, we've been watching. And that is the visit of the Pope to the United States of America. His uh, welcome there at the White House, his addressing of Congress, the addressing to the United Nations Council, the General Council. And it's something that's caught many of our attentions. Why? Is it because he's the Pope? Well, maybe. Is it because he's a world leader? Well, maybe. More specifically, it's because of Bible prophecy. Because of what the book of Revelation says about the last days. In Revelation 13, 3, we're told that all the world marveled at the beast. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, we read that the call goes out that there's peace and safety. See, the Pope addressed the United Nations General Council, the world leaders. He also let out in a, um, a time of memorial at the 9-11 memorial with other major world leaders religions. And many of us have taken note of these things. And I believe that we are seeing fulfillment of prophecy. We are seeing the days in which we live. And I think the Bible is very clear about this, but I don't want to get caught up in the hubbub of this visit. Now you may say, well, what in the world? What are you talking about? (laughs) Well, you see, we're given indicators in Scripture. And they're important to watch. We must have our eyes open. We must watch what is taking place in the world around us. But it does us no good to just watch. We must prepare and we must share the good news. We must carry out the the gospel commission that God has given us. And that is to make disciples of all nations. We see that time is short. Let us not huddle around and say, oh no, what's going to happen? But let's go out. Let's tell the message to the world, even as we see the signs appearing, so that not one will be left behind. Not one will not be in heaven there with their creator. So the indicators that we're seeing all around us, they indicate the end is coming, and I am fully aware of that. But let's take this as as an opportunity to go and share with the dying world around us that Jesus loves them. And that Jesus wants them in heaven with him for all eternity. Well, I have to say it is great to be back here with our church family. My wife and kids were here at early service, so if you're wondering, well, what's, where are they? Are they okay? They're absolutely fine. Um, but we are so glad to be back. And as far as I am aware, as far as my planning goes, I plan on being here the rest of the year. With the exception of one Sabbath. I have to take one vacation, but... Otherwise, I plan on being here. We miss our church family when we're gone. Please know, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. We've been doing an awful lot of traveling, and we sure love it when we get to come home. And so um, we're glad to be back. And because I'm planning on being here now for the rest of the year, we're going to embark on a seven-part series beginning today. This seven-part series is all about stewardship. Now, before you think that I'm going to harass you for seven weeks about giving money to the church. I have to tell you something. I'm not. I'm not. Because I believe stewardship has to do with so much more than just money. We are stewards of all that God has given us, and that's not just money. Now, money is a part of that. But there's so much more. We are stewards of everything that we have. So over the next seven weeks, we're going to look at the seven T's of stewardship. That would be time, talent, treasure, you know what's there, temple, testimony, our ties, and the kingdom. So I hope that you will continue with us over the next seven weeks as we look at the truths from Scripture. God has give us, given us everything we have. We're responsible for the way that we use those gifts. It's kind of like this. When man finds Jesus... It costs him everything. Jesus has happiness, joy, peace, healing, security, and eternity. Man marvels at such a pearl and says, Well, I want this pearl. How much does it cost? It's too dear. 
too costly. But how much? Well, it's very expensive. Well, do you think that I could buy it? It costs everything you have. No more, no less. So anybody can buy it. I'll buy it. What do you have? Let's write it down. Well, uh, I have $10,000 in the bank. Good. $10,000. What else? Well, that's all. Um, that's all I have. Have you nothing more? Well, uh, I do have some dollars here in my pocket. How many? Uh, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. 120 bucks. That's fine. But what else do you have? Well, nothing else. That's all. Where do you live? Well, in my house. The house, too. You mean I have to stay in the garage? You have a garage, too? <laughs> that, too. What else? <laughs> so now you have my money. You have my house and my garage. You mean I'm going to have to stay in the car? You have a car? Well, two. Both become mine. Both cars. What else? Well, you have my house, my garage, the cars, the money, everything. What else? Are you alone in the world? <laughs> well, no. I, my wife and two kids. Your wife and children, too. Two? Yes. Everything you have. What else? Well, I have nothing else. I'm left alone. Oh, you too. Everything becomes mine. Wife, children, house, money, clothes, everything. And you too. Now you can use all those things here. But don't forget, they are mine, as you are. When I need any of these things you are using, you must give them to me because now I am the owner. So, for the next seven weeks, we will be looking at what it means to be stewards of all that we have. I hope you'll continue with us as we look at these Bible truths. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, we invite you to be in this place. Speak to our hearts and our minds. May we recognize the privilege it is to be stewards of all that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you had a bank that credited your account each morning with $86,000, that carried over no balance from day to day, that allowed you to keep no cash in your account, and every evening canceled whatever part of the amount you failed to use during the day, what would you do? <laughs> yeah, you got it figured out. You'd draw out every cent every day, and you'd use it to your advantage. Well, the reality is, we do. We have a bank just like that, and it's called time. Time. Every morning it credits you with 86,400 seconds. Every night it rules off as lost whatever of this you failed to invest to good purposes. It carries over no balances. It allows no overdrafts. Each day it opens a new account with you. If you fail to use the day's deposits, the loss is yours. There's no going back and there's no drawing against tomorrow. So today, we're talking about time. But really, what is time? What is time? Well, the reality is, I'm not sure if anybody knows, because even Merriam-Webster has a hard time defining it. Merriam-Webster has 64 entries as to the definition of time. And for your sanity and mine, we're not going to go over all 64 this morning. I hope you're thankful. <laughs> I think the first definition that we're giving will suffice. 
The first definition from Merriam-Webster's on time is this. Time is the system of those sequential relations that any event has to any other as past, present, or future. Indefinite and continuous duration regarded as that in which events succeed one another. Now that's a mouthful. Did you follow it? Well, our concept of time really tends to refer to cycles of time. For instance, we count things off by years, right? A year is one rotation of the earth, or one, yeah, one rotation of the earth around the sun. We can break it down a little smaller. We have months. This is the time that it takes the moon to go around the earth. Well, then we can break it down smaller yet into weeks. These were designed by God. Then we can go even smaller to a day. That's the rotation of the earth one time. We can break that down even further. 24 hours equals a day. 60 minutes equals one hour. And 60 seconds equals one minute. Now, we can continue to go on down, but for all intents and purposes, this is sufficient. So our time is broken down by segments. These are ways for us to keep track of where we are in our lives, how our business is doing, and where we are in the work week. My son asks me from time to time, Dad, what day is it? He's specifically asking that now because his birthday's coming up. Dad, what day is it? When's it going to be October? So he's very excited about this. We learn at a very young age to count off time, to recognize events in life by time. Oh, it was my fourth birthday when I got my bike. Oh, it was my 10th birthday when this happened. Oh, I drove at my 16th birthday. So we have all these processes of time, all these rotations, these cycles. I want to take a brief look at the week. We said a week is seven days. Now, we get this seven-day week from the Bible. There is no other explanation for it. There's no astronomical explanation for the week. There is for a year, for a month, for a day, but not for the week. There have been countries down through time that have uh, tried variations of the seven-day week. The Chinese and the Egyptians tried 10-day weeks. How would you like that? No, thank you. France tried a 10-day week for nearly 10 years. In ancient Rome, they tried an 8-day week. In the late 20s and early 30s, the USSR tried a five-day week. Then they changed it to a six-day week. And all of these nations eventually came back to a seven-day week. I believe this is because God created it this way. He created us for a seven-day cycle. God knew this is what we would need. We see many examples of the seven-day cycle throughout Scripture. For example, in the very beginning. The first six days of creation, the Bible tells us that God filled the earth with all the things that life would need to be sustained. And then he went on to fill it with life from the green, uh, green plants to the animals, the birds in the air, the animals, uh, the creatures in the sea. Six days, God filled the earth. And on the seventh, he rested. He created a time for rest. He gave us a pattern to follow in the fourth commandment. We read that six days are given for work. The seventh is for relationships. How about the children of Israel in the desert? They went out and they started bellyaching to God, or actually to Moses. Hey, we don't have any food. We should have just died in Egypt. Why'd you bring us out here to starve us? So Moses goes to God and God says, all right, I'm going to give you food. Every day, manna will be on the ground. You go collect it. For six days, collect the manna on the ground. But on the seventh day, There won't be any. Moses went up Mount Sinai. He went up Mount Sinai to meet God. And Exodus 24 tells us that he was on the the mountain for six days. And then, on the seventh, God met with him. Exodus 31 tells us that there are six days for work. And then we are to rest on the seventh. At the Passover, we read that there were to be six days of unleavened bread, and then there was a sacred assembly on the seventh. Think about the impenetrable city of Jericho. The children of Israel have just crossed over the Jordan River. They've seen God work miraculously, and then God says, all right, for the next six days, you walk around this big city one time. And so they march around the city one time for six days, and on the seventh... God says, march around seven times today, and the city is yours. 
So the weekly cycle is talked about throughout Scripture. Many stories, we see this seven-day cycle. So we recognize that this seven-day cycle exists, right? We don't have any trouble with this weekly cycle. But what else does the Bible tell us about time? Now hang on to your britches here. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. That's a lot of time. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A a time to keep and a time to throw away. (laughs) Some of us need to visit that throw away time. Um, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Solomon here tells us there is time for everything in life. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 90, verse 12, so teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We're told to keep track of our days, use our time wisely to be careful with the time that we're given. Time is also used when talking about Bible prophecy. Very familiar passages, the 2300-day prophecy, the 1260-day prophecy, the 1335-day prophecy, the 490-year prophecy. We could go on. Time is everywhere in Scripture. So many different places talked about in so many different ways. Well, the emphasis of this series that we embark on today is how we can be stewards of what God has given us. In this case, we're talking about time. One of the most obvious ways to be good stewards of the time that we have is in the use of of Sabbath. God tells all humanity in Exodus chapter 20, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we are to remember the Sabbath. We're not to forget what day it is. We are to rem- remember that the seventh day of the week is special. It's not ordinary. It's extraordinary. Secondly, we are to keep the Sabbath holy. Now, the word for holy here in the Hebrew means to be sacred, to be set apart, to be consecrated. The Sabbath is a special day to be different than all the rest. So what does this mean? We don't use the Sabbath for the same stuff we use every other day for. The Sabbath is different. No more school, amen, students? (laughs) No more work, amen, adults? We get a break. And notice in verse 9 there in Exodus 20, God makes a separation of the days. He says, six days you shall labor and do all your work. He says, get it all done. Six days, I've given you plenty of time. That's your work time. You take care of your work on those six days. But the Sabbath, it's not for work. It's to be different. It's to be set apart. It's like a vacation. How great is that? (laughs) Better than your employer, huh? (laughs) You get a vacation every week. How great is vacation if you take a work project with you? How great is vacation if you take your phone with you on vacation and you continue to get calls about work? You know, several weeks ago, our family went camping. And you know the best thing about that trip? I had no cell service. I was gone. So unless you put a GPS on my trailer or you followed me, you weren't getting a hold of me. Now, I have to admit, for a few hours, things continue to run through my head. Oh, I got this and I got to do that and I got to think about it. But after a little while, I was on vacation, man. (laughs) I didn't have to think about any of that. I got to just be with my family. I got, to, I got to take all the stuff of the week and put it aside. I got to have vacation. 
I had a day like I hadn't had in quite a while. So God says, Sabbath is to be a vacation for you. You got six days to do all your work. You do it then. The seventh day, it's supposed to be completely different. It's a new day. It's an opportunity to leave everything behind, to spend the day with God and with our family and friends, spending time with those that really count. You know how it is, those of you who have had children, those of you who have been children, during the week, parents work. Kids want to play all the time. But there's responsibilities that we have. We've got to take care of the house. We've got to take care of the cars. We've got to go to work. We've got to go get groceries. We've got to run the errands. We've got all these things to do, and they take away from that time that we have together. But you know what? We have six days for all that. And we have one day to spend together. One day that God designed as a vacation for every human on the earth. Isn't God good? Now, I can hear somebody say, but, but pastor, you don't understand. You don't understand. I, can get, I can't get everything done if I don't work for part of the Sabbath. I, I just can't do it. I have too much to do. I have to work on projects or that assignment. It's due this next Monday, and I've got too much to work to do. I've got to work on it on Sabbath. Friends, I want to encourage you to trust Jesus. He has a way of helping things to work out when we honor him, even though it doesn't make sense. I'll use the illustration of my wife since she's not here. No, I won't get in trouble. But when she was in PA school, not all of her classmates were Adventists. They'd have a big test coming up on Monday. And so you know what everybody's doing all weekend. They're cramming all weekend long from Friday until they, when they got out of school until Monday when they sat in there for the test. Well, Lisa had the habit of taking Sabbath as a vacation day. From Friday night to Saturday night, she didn't touch her books. She went to Vespers. We went out to Pioneers Park. We did things with the, with the different clubs on campus, enjoying the Sabbath. But you know, Saturday night she hid her books. I could never bring myself to do that, but she did. And she was in the top of her class. God honored her, I believe, when she honored him. God has a way of making the impossible possible when we do what he asks us to do. It doesn't make sense to our human logic. But you see, God doesn't operate under our human logic. He operates under what he knows is best. And so he told us, take a vacation day every week. So if that's you saying, well, I just can't get everything done if I don't work on Sabbath, I want to challenge you to apply Proverbs 3 in your life. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. That means with your time too. And He shall direct your paths. God makes everything possible when we put Him first. So, the question has been asked to me before. Well, what can I do on Sabbath? Can I do this? Can I do that? Well, get out your pens and paper. Here comes a list. All right? You got that ready? Isaiah chapter 58, verses 13 and 14. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own own pleasures, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the things of this world. Right? No. We'll delight ourselves in the Lord, and I will cause you, God says, to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. So there's your list. There's your list. That's it. We can do all those things that honor God. All those things that bring him pleasure. We can do all those things that bring about his words. All those things that lead us in his ways. Some people would see the fourth commandment as a restriction on what we can do. Keep the Sabbath holy. But no, it gives us freedom. He doesn't say, well, don't do this and don't do that. and don't. No, 
He says, you can do all these things. You have freedom to have vacation, to have vacation with the Lord. It doesn't get any better than that, friends. A Sabbath is a wonderful day to enjoy a break and to bask in the presence of Jesus with nothing getting in the way. Now, back in Exodus chapter 20, God tells us that we have six days for what? For all our labor, all of our work, we have six 24-hour periods to get all that stuff done. That's the vast majority of the week, if you didn't catch that. (laughs) Six out of seven. We have six days to do all the stuff we've got to do. Now, if we go back to our initial premise that all we have, all we are, belongs to God, this would apply to our time as well, right? Right? So if our time belongs to God, what does this mean? How do we use our time in a way that honors God when we're doing all our work? Now, please understand, I am not suggesting that you all camp out here at the church every minute of every day of every week of every year. That's not the idea. Don't come out and camp here at the church. You'll get lonely. And this would be a messy place. (laughs) When it comes to time, it's interesting how we spend it. Have you ever stopped and thought about how you use your time? What consumes your time? In a lifelong average, American lifetime, this is how um, some would suggest that time is used. Six months sitting at stoplights. Eight months opening junk mail. One year looking for misplaced objects. Two years unsuccessfully returning phone calls. Four years doing housework. Five waiting in line. And six years filling our faces. (laughs) Now, some of us would consider that really good time. And that's all right. I enjoy eating just as much as the next. But these are interesting things. Obviously, the study's a little older. We probably don't spend that much time opening junk mail now. However, we do spend that much time going through our inbox, getting rid of spam, right? Trying to unsubscribe from junk or just ignoring it. So we waste a lot of time. Now, there's a whole lot of the things that today I imagine might be on that list that aren't there now. Things such as, well, I probably shouldn't go down that road. Facebook. Needless to say... (laughs) Needless to say, there's a lot of time that's wasted in this life. So how can we use each moment to honor God? If we're not going to be in the church all the time, which that would be a travesty, how would we do it? Well, I would suggest that we honor God with our time through our actions, through what we do. We should live our life in such a way that if Jesus were to come at any moment, we wouldn't be shocked. We wouldn't be embarrassed. We wouldn't be wishing he'd come five minutes earlier or ten minutes later. We live our lives in a way that at any moment we would welcome Jesus to waltz into our life. We should not be caught wishing that we had more time to get ready. Let us spend our time in a way that honors God each moment of every day, every day of every year, and every year of our life. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31 says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Lloyd C. Douglas tells the story of Thomas Hearn, who, in his journey to the mouth of the Coppermine River, wrote that a few days after they had started on their expedition, a party of Indians stole most of their supplies. His comment on the apparent misfortune was, The weight of our baggage being so much lightened, our next day's journey was much more swift and pleasant. (laughs) Isn't that a great perspective? Hearn was en route to something very interesting and important. And the loss of a few sides of bacon and a couple of bags of flour meant nothing more than an easing of the load. Had Hearn been holed in somewhere in some cabin, resolved to spend the last days eking out an existence and living on capital previously collected, the loss of some of his stores by plunder would probably have worried him almost to death. How we respond to losing 
some of our resources for God's work depends upon whether we are on the move or waiting for our last stand. So friends, let's not use our time to hunker down, to protect ourselves, to be getting scared about what the last days hold or or how quickly they come. Let's use that time that God has given us to spread the news that Jesus loves this world that he wants to save every sinner, and that he's coming soon. You see, we're just passing through this old world. We're headed to a better home. We are on a journey. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you to use your time in a way that honors God. Let us be good stewards of our time. Father in heaven, this morning we come to you thankful for the gift of time that you've given to us. Lord, sometimes it feels like it slips through our hands far too fast. But Lord, I pray that you will help us all to be good stewards of the time that you've given us. Help us to make the most of every minute of our life. And Lord, help us to be your witnesses to this world so that on that day when you do come, when time ceases as we know it, may we be found ready and waiting with a whole host of those who you have given us the opportunity to share you with. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.